Hernandez. We have three members in the quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Villanueva. We established a quorum. Colleagues, we have eight items on the agenda today. We're going to continue item one. I recommend adopting items three, seven, and eight on consent, um, if that's OK with you two. Mm -hmm. We're going to now open public comment. Uh, Ms. Cadigan heard, would you please read the instructions on how to give public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the public will have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total, and one minute for general public comment. We will tell you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on a specific agenda item, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or again stray off topic, the chair will cut you off, and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first up is Goat Puppet, followed by Herman, followed by Mike Greenspan. Yes. <laughs> Okay. What would you like to speak on? Oh, I'd like to speak on all the goddamn items in general fucking public comment. <laughs> you have two minutes for the items and one minute yes. for general. <laughs> That's right, humans. Yes. So let's go over these things. We have the LADWP, which is a criminal organization. Let's give them a hand. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's right. Why is your general manager sitting in federal prison for seven and a half years? Why couldn't you have told the truth to the FBI that he had nothing to do with it? <laughs> but look at this. You want a bi-weekly proposal for bidding. That's not reasonably practicable. I don't know what that means. Why can't you just fairly bid these things out? Why all the crime? And why is Mr. Pickle not using his brain instead of acting like a pickle and stopping these criminals from doing this. <laughs> and building electrification and clean energy. There is no clean energy, human. You have to have generators that you put the gas into, and then the gas turns it into electricity. <laughs> you will never stop that, despite all of your efforts. Yes, and that's good now. The ramen noodle is back in, and we have a quorum. Let's give her a hand. Yay! <laughs> and then we have the Pacific Railroad Company. They're a bunch of bastards. I don't want to deal with them. No. And then, of course, we have what else here? Some more bullshit on number four, the Nithia Ramen Noodle Air Conditioner Program. Now that we've educated her, and educated her radical communist staff. <laughs> she realizes now that it's gonna to cost too much money to implement this plan, and she's gonna join Pat McOsker in deferring this item again. Thank you, Pat, known as Tim, known as Pat. Yes, we don't want this on number four. It costs too much money. <laughs> and then the, the items here, yes, you know that the LA City Council is a criminal organization. <laughs> That's why you have in-person only. You see how they do that, members of the DWP? Then when they have their regular council meeting and it's hybrid, they will close all of these items and not allow the public on the phone to speak at the next council meeting. You know what you call that? It's called structuring. <laughs> That's right, you're structuring L rules and procedures to get around the Brown Act. That is a misdemeanor. But a conspiracy to commit a misdemeanor is... Sergeant Graciano, what is it called? Well, it's called a felony. That's right, thank you for that, yes. Okay. That's what you're engaged in. So, continue with your jailbait programs. And again, we really like the change in Nithia's hair. It's so pretty and so curly. Yes. <laughs> Next, we have Mike Greenspan. Walk out of here. 
Mike Greenspan, uh, all items and then public comment. If you want to start the clock. You have two minutes for the items and one minute for general okay, public comment. Okay, a, a brewing butt kicking Florida Gator. Let me tell you, folks, this first thing. You got, oh man, you even got Coretz's name on it. Didn't they, didn't he, that fat pig get rejected last election when he went for higher office? Yes, Bureau of Sanitation. You know, I've been in contact with them plenty of times. We've got Republic, and they keep failing to pick up our trash. Boy, they've been in our building plenty of times. Thank you, Republic, for not picking up the trash. The city shoved them down our throat. We had to give up waste management, a good company for Republic. How bad can it be? Well, they, they just don't pick up the trash. It's an option for them. And people actually are hurt by that. Now, zero waste city facilities. Are you kidding? I just saw the KNX reporter take his coffee cup with coffee in it and throw it in the recycled bin. If, we, if, the, if those reporters can't get it right, how can anybody else at City Hall get it right? Quit throwing trash in the recycle bin right here at City Hall, right outside the door. Now, what else? Okay, about plastics. Well, I got plastics in here. It's probably my biggest volume in recycling are these number one plastics. I mean, cans are nice and bottles aren't bad, but over half my load is number one plastic. So we need to be having a good policy for recycling them. And the very same politicians that talk about recycling this and recycling that are the ones that throw their plastic water bottles in the trash can. They don't get it. They just go through the motions, but when it comes time to doing something, they can't. And, gee, do I have time on the last step? Well, clean energy and DWP, that just doesn't mix. Now, let me tell you about, we have this great trash company, Waste Management. And what happened? How come we don't have them anymore? Because they didn't want more than one trash truck that pollutes the air coming through an area. So they assigned us, they assigned us a trash company. And I guess we drew the short straw over there in North Hollywood. We have Republic. Well, Republic's always trying to get a contract with Metro. Republic sure picks up the trash at USC. But in our building over there in North Hollywood, in Krikorian's district, picking up the trash is an option. I always would kid people who are business students. They have a great business model. They charge you, and then they don't pick it up, so they get 100% profit. It's not what you know, it's who you know, and obviously Republic knows some of you crooked politicians that, that they're shoving their company down our fucking throats. Mr. Hunt. Okay, if we're all through with public comment. Um, See no more speakers in the queue. We're going to close public comment. We're ready to vote on the consent items, which are items three, seven, and eight, and on the continued item, which is item one. And with that, I move approval of those items. Mr. Jones, call the roll. Councilmember Yaroslavsky? Yes. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Rahman? Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield? Councilmember Hernandez? Um, items three, seven, and eight are approved on consent, and item one is continued. Thank you very much. And we're going to turn to item two. Mr. Sutton Wills, would you please read the item to the record? Item number two is the Bureau of Sanitation report relative to the implementation of zero waste city facilities and events ordinance number 187718 and the zero waste plans. Thank you very much. Uh, we have today uh, staff from the Bureau of Sanitation and the CAO. Uh, I'd be grateful if you could come forward. Okay. 
this on? Yeah, oh, bring it a little closer. Goes closer. Thank so you. I want to start by thanking staff who've been working on this issue and specifically want to acknowledge the thoroughness of the report. It's excellent. Um, reducing the amount of waste generated is the cornerstone of a successful waste management approach. Um, so your work here trickles into so many other aspects of sanitation's work. So thank you very much. I just have a couple of questions and then I'll open it up to colleagues. Um, okay. Could you walk through please what the city hall pilot is going to look like? Sure. And then, yeah, I'll just, for a little more context, the report referenced varying levels of quality in the zero waste plans from departments. Um, is it your expectation that by having departments submit their plans to this committee, we're going to raise the collective caliber of these plans and their implementation? So first, walk us through what the pilot's going to look you. like, and then how do we make sure that there's uniform excellence across what we're getting from departments? Um, Thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, we have met with General Services several times to discuss implementation of the Food Waste Organics Collection Pilot Program. Can you introduce yourself? I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer Pinkerton with LA Sanitation. Um, so we have met with General Services several times to discuss implementation of the Food Waste Collection Pilot Program for City Hall. Um, we've acquired all the supplies that we need, such as dedicated bins. We've come to an agreement with General Services that their nighttime custodial staff will be the ones picking up the food waste because my recycling crew of 18 people, um, they do not have direct access to the council offices. So a lot of our discussions have been addressing barriers. <laughs> Apologies. And we've worked out a system for getting the food waste from inside this building out to the service courtyard and then how it will be arranged to be picked up and taken to our transfer station. So we are very close to being able to implement this. We are waiting for some council offices to get back to us because we would like to provide training in advance of the launch of the program to explain to everybody what goes into the bins, what can't go into the bins, and how the process works. So any assistance you can offer us in that regard would be very, very helpful. Um, and, you know, but we want it to be successful, so if you have any con concerns about how we're going to implement it, let us know. But we do plan to provide stainless steel bins for each office. And you also have the option of the uh, about two-gallon food waste pails that have been distributed to residents. So we're really just waiting for feedback from council offices so we can initiate, initiate the training for council staff. And, Great. And if I could add to that, um, I'm Rowena Romano, I'm the division manager for the citywide recycling, and this is my environmental affairs officer, um, assistant division manager, Jennifer Pinkerton as well. Um, just to add to that as well, we are waiting to um, purchase bins um, that will be the collective site for all of the materials that we collect from the city hall offices. Um, these offices that we'll start in are gonna be your council offices as well as the mayor's offices. Um, and also Board of Public Works. So those are the places that we um, plan to start with. Um, and so we're also looking at purchasing a uh, rodent-proof bear bin, which will be um, down in, in the um, cor courtyard where all of this material will be gathered and then we'll have an LA sanitation crew come and pick that up on a daily basis. So, and we will also be planning for weekends so that none of that material stays um, over the weekend. And one item to tap into that, there are quite a few catered events now being held in City Hall, so we're still in discussions with General Services about that because we want to make sure that food waste is collected after each event and then delivered to the service courtyard. We do have outreach materials developed and we're thinking of launching a teaser campaign consisting of a few emails to which we would attach the flyers, but I think one-on-one -on -one in person training is going to be our best bet. Thanks. Agreed. Uh, the second question is really about um, making sure that the departments of the city, once we're ready to roll out with the department um, approach, making sure that the caliber of those reports are uniform and excellent. And so do you think having those reports come through this, this uh, body will be helpful in making sure that they're all well done and thorough? Are there other things we can be doing to make sure that as, as each department is rolling out how they're gonna implement, um, that they're doing it sort of to a basic level of uh, quality. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you're referring to the zero waste departmental plans? Yeah. Um, there was discussion initially about this, and we think the best bet is to have each department report back to this body on their own versus going through us. Um, I will tell you, though, we developed a zero waste checklist that was to be used to guide the departments in developing their plans. 
Um, I think many of them do need beefing up. We're, there are, many of them lack implementation dates, um, evaluation dates, but it, it is a learning process. We're, we are, in effect, asking every department to review their processes, their operations, everything through the prism of zero waste. We are here to assist, but I think, I think it's best if they do report directly to you. Great. Thank you so much. Colleagues, any questions? Councilwoman Robin. Um, I had a question about kind of how we, so I think it's, it is really important to be reporting to this committee, and I'm excited that, that the report um, came back and that, as Councilmember Yaroslavsky mentioned, that it was so robust, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm also curious about how we report our progress to the public, especially given that we're asking a lot of residents of Los Angeles and in, in moving us towards, you know, our AB uh, 1383 goals and um, just overall in terms of managing waste. We're trying to get people to be more responsible and more responsive. So I'm just curious about are there ways in which we could report out to the public? Could we? post the plans and the data mm -hmm. about waste diversion by department publicly mm -hmm. somewhere in an easily accessible place? Um, and is it something that we could be a little bit more proactive about sharing? I think, um, uh, yes, thank you for your question, um, Council Member Rahman. Um, so LA Sanitation does try its best to put out the information out, out there um, regarding SB 1383. Um, about the new recycling with the plastics. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, there is al always room for improvement for that. So we will definitely take that back and see how we can, you know, um, relay our, um, our achievements out into the public more. Um, in terms of the departments, I think one of our recommendations was for um, direction of the CAO and CLA to help bring these departments together. And together we can, you know, come up with creative ideas on how do we get all of this messaging out um, and also, you know, the accomplishments of each department and how they're, we're trying to lead by example within City Hall, within our city events, um, within our own departments. So then those things are relayed back to their employees, you know, relayed back to their homes and their families, um, as well as the students, you know, in, in our schools. So there's always, um, yes, always room for improvement, um, definitely. And yes, we, um, you know, we'll, definitely need to put out more of our progress and our achievements out into the public so that they can catch on and they can adopt these behaviors, which, you know, is a change in, 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 in our everyday lives. So, um, and that's part of what, you know, Jennifer and I are trying to do with all of these zero waste um, initiatives is not just trying to change the behavior, but also help people and the departments um, progress in their behavior change. Um, you know, I, I think in our report, what we did mention is that this is gonna, Take a, take a while for, for our participants of our city events as well as our own employees to catch on to this. So that, that's what Jennifer and I are championing and, and trying to make that change within our, our own offices. And council member, if I could add to that quickly, there is a lot of information out there about events. Unfortunately, we have no central repository for information. So we're looking at metrics, one thing, you know, there are about 10 or 12 city departments involved in events, restaurants, et cetera, that are directly impacted by this. Um, having databases would be helpful, knowing the number of events that took place and complied with the zero waste mm. requirements would be helpful. Um, one of our big areas of concern is making sure we track the weight of the food waste that is collected, as well as edible surplus food that we rescue and give to communities in need. Um, so we're, we're developing that. It's just the city, as you are aware, is very siloed. Um, mm -hmm. So integrating these practices into, say, El Pueblo's events, <clears throat> excuse me, in restaurants and events that are coordinated by general services will probably take several years. We cannot impose zero waste mandates until new contracts are put in place. We're not allowed to open existing contracts. But there is a lot of data out there. Um, we believe. This building has a, generates a very high rate of food waste compared to other office space buildings, probably because you have so many visitors here. But it would be helpful for us, you know, and to report to you also on, on the findings that come out of this. Thank you. Um, and then the other question I had, I um, just, you know, LAWA, the ports, um, how are they engaged? Right, so um, we do, um, I do know that we work with LAWA, um, sanitation does, 
Um, in my previous role um, in sanitation, I was one of the contract managers for our MOU with LAWA, and we worked directly with their maintenance services division to um, help them with their recycling. We pick up their recycling as well as we implemented organics program um, into some of the concessions, some of the restaurants we piloted first. Um, and then we were able to work with Lawa to get into the lounges where they, you know, have a lot of the food um, waste in the kitchen prep areas. Um, I do have to get back to you on where they are um, in that progress. Um, I believe COVID um, played a role in, you know, stopping some of that. So I, I believe they have come back, um, but I can get some progress reports on that one. Thank you. Mr. McCosker. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I concur. It's a great report. Really, really, really appreciate it. Excited about this. This is something that's been important to so many of us, and I realize how difficult it is. I mean, we endeavor to be zero waste for our, our events coming out of our office, and we know how hard it is. I mean, we have, uh, we schlep dishes in and out of the events <laughs> off-site all the time, and we wash them on weekends, and it's right. really hard. We do use linens, mm -hmm. literally use linens, and launder our own paper, our own stuff without <laughs> right. trying to avoid paper. It's hard. Thank right. you. Hard, hard, hard work. I totally get that. I like the recommendations um, that directing all the city departments, of course, to report up, and I appreciate that you that it might be a direct report up, and and not through you know uh, one of your departments. Um, I would like to add to this, and I, or, or maybe it includes it, I just want to be clear that, that while we can't direct the proprietaries, um, I would like to have that included as well, for the, uh, included in the reports, each, each city controlled or you know, uh, city council or uh, ordinance or charter department to report to us, and the proprietaries make the request that they send up their zero waste progress. I do think that um, LADWP and airport have zero waste plans. I do not believe the port does. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was the case. Um, I like the idea of the pilot program with um, uh, with food rescue organizations. Uh, when we look at the the staffing, I mean, there's a recommendation for the CIO to provide funding to SAN for 2024-25 for two positions. I would like. I think that should include repurposing any resolution position or vacant position, mm -hmm. uh, so that we can have a sort of a clearer path, less resistance to do this because the coordinator is going to be really, really important, I think. Um, on, um, when we talk about council, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the, I think one of the greatest contributors, besides our own events, uh, are events that we sponsor. Mm -hmm. We sponsor so many events, and those typically don't have long-term contracts, those are typical short-term contracts. And could we look at ways that sponsorships are going to include mm -hmm. the incentive to, ha to uh, reduce waste to get to zero waste. We're trying to do that with events that we do, that we sponsor now in CD15, where we ask folks to be zero waste, and it comes with a follow-up, okay, who's gonna pay for that? So I think we have to have our eyes wide open, and maybe council offices need things like, you know, large filtered water containers so that, we, so that we're not, you know, doing plastic, uh, council offices having access to reusable, washable plates and uh, cups. Uh, for events, I mean, I, I, it, let's make sure as we're educating council offices that folks are going in wide-eyed because, boy, mm -hmm. waste sneaks up on you when you least expect it. But I love this report. I really, really Thank appreciate you. it. And Thank I think you. that's something we all endeavor to get to. And I have an important question for the department. When I look at page six, LA Sands Zero Waste Events Implementation, there's a reference to an unnamed person, thanks to great and valuable feedback at a Harbor Yard open house event, LSAN modified its that, procedure. <laughs> Who was that? That was your yes, wife. Your wife. And I thought so. <laughs> okay, I, wanted, I have a story to tell tonight. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and I just wanted to maybe point out that um, in terms of uh, getting the word out, LA Sand does also have the um, LA Sand special events. So any of the events, city events that come through LA Sanitation, um, Jennifer and I have worked with the, you know, those who work in that area and they have, they will be also putting out the zero waste ordinance and, you, you know, giving guidance to those folks who come through the LA Sand special event services. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great report. I really appreciate it. I don't, other than those clarifications, I don't have any recommendations. Thank you. 
May I tee off one comment before we leave for Councilmember Gosker? Um, we need a contract or access or to expand an existing contract for reusable foodware. The city does not have that as far as yeah. I've been able to determine because that does affect restaurants. Um, we have farmers markets, we have all the events. If we could move towards standardized foodware for some of these elements, that would greatly facilitate the transition, but we have no such contract at this point. So that is one of our specific barriers. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Member Woonfield. Thank you, and, and apologize, I was, double books was a little late here. Uh, but following up on something, Mr. Koskar, and, and thank you for the report, and, and I'm a big proponent of this as well. And the, you mentioned extra costs for the green bins. For example, so who bears that? Is it when we have these community events, um, are we asking the organization to pay for it, or or how is that going to work? Yeah, some of these are small organizations. Um, from our understanding, with LA Sand Special Events, when it comes through, there is a cost for the service itself. Um, so that includes the cost of the the bins, and I think they also have um, an option there for bin attendance. So that is. Um, I think they provide you or, you know, the um, sponsor or whoever is coming through to have our services. There's a, a menu of items, a la carte of items. Um, they have possibly prepackaged mm -hmm. packaged things that um, the person can then check off, and that would be the cost that is um, relayed to the event sponsor. So it is the organization, like the, yes. if it's a small organization and they're doing an event, yeah. they're going to have to bear that extra cost. Yes, sir. Um, and how much is it for those? I don't, I don't have that in front of me, but I can get that um, list, that yeah. uh, cost list. I mean, so I wonder if there's a way, you know, like we had, like council offices get a certain amount of funding discretionary mm -hmm. for buses or for uh, tables and chairs. We used to get a certain amount mm -hmm. and people got used to coming to us for that particular item. I see. I wonder if there's a way to do something like this so that one of the things we could offer as a council when as a council office when we sponsor an event to say hey and, and i will allocate you the bins and the services something to that effect because well it's all very important i do worry about these organizations that are sure yeah you know struggling to put these events on and, and this is going to be tough mm -hmm. for them council member i do believe the packages the special events divisions packages range from about 800 up to excess of six thousand dollars depending on how many bins are provided? You know, the 6,000 would be for very large events such as Taste of Soul. Um, but the green bins are now required under SB 1383. There are also the green some. Bins are, I didn't hear that. Or what? Uh, uh, green bins are now required under SB 1383. We have to collect and divert the organic material. I will also say there are a couple costs internally that are not covered. Um, when events are coordinated, events in this building are coordinated through general services. Um, that does not go through our special events. It's optional to request recycling bins, and they t it's optional to request a custodian to come through. So that's one reason the event attendants are so um, critical for events held in this building to make sure that the food waste is separated, picked up at the conclusion of the events. So just be aware that we do have a lot of, we have processes in place that are decades old that did not and, you know, envision anything like zero waste, mean collect and separate materials as we're required to do so now. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you so much. Uh, let's vote to approve the report, please, uh, and the recommendations. Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Yaroslavsky? Yes. Councilmember Oscar? Yes. Councilmember Rahman? Yes. Councilmember mm -hmm. Bloomfield? Bloomfield, aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Four ayes, and the item is approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Turning to item four, uh, Mr. Sutton Wills, would you please read the item? Item number four is the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power report relative to response to the motion requiring cooling apparatus in all residential rental units and potential programs to assist low income and middle income tenants. This item is continued from our August 25th meeting. Thank you very much. We have staff here from DWP. Welcome. As you're coming forward, I'm going to share just a few initial thoughts on this report back. Um, so I want to open by thanking Councilmember Hernandez, who's not here, um, uh, for putting this motion forward. It speaks to the urgent issue of protecting Angelinos, especially the most vulnerable from the threat of extreme heat. And it poses the question of what is needed from the city to avoid a serious threat to public health. 
I'm also going to add a little context. Uh, there's a new book recommended by the LA Times a couple weeks ago called The Heat Will Kill You First by Jeff Goodall. And there's some startling figures that stand out that are worth articulating here. It's reported that an estimated 489,000 people worldwide died from extreme heat in 2019 alone, which is far more than all other natural disasters combined, including hurricanes and wildfires. It's also more than the number of deaths from guns or illegal drugs. Um, we all remember the heat storm in the Pacific Northwest a few years ago. That event killed over 600 people, many of whom died in their homes or apartments because they lacked basic cooling equipment. The simple fact is that heat is deadly, but too often goes unreported or even ignored. Um, and more locally, I just want to point out that just a couple of weeks ago, we faced a heat wave, which was then followed by a historic tropical storm, the first of its kind in over 100 years. So the report comes uh, to our committee at the exact moment when we're being reminded of what we stand to lose if we're unprepared to meet the needs of our residents in the face of climate change. Recently, the county released a comprehensive climate vulnerability assessment showing that an estimated 2.2 million LA County residents will reside in areas with high social vulnerability to extreme heat by 2050. It also found that while about 49% of the county's population is Latino, this population comprises about 67% of the people in communities that have a high vulnerability to extreme heat. So I expect we're going to hear about the many impacts that a requirement for cooling devices in rental units would have on our infrastructure and on our power grid, and I'm sure the challenges will be great, uh, but we simply can't accept a future in which a family's ability to insulate themselves from the most severe effects of climate change is determined by their income level or their race. Thank you very much. DWP, um, turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, committee. My name is Ashley Negretti. I'm one of the managers in the Distributed Energy Solutions Group at LADWP. Um, I want to echo what you just stated. Um, heat waves that last from a few days to several weeks can be extremely deadly. Um, last year in August, LADWP's board, President Commissioner McLean Hill, and um, the mayor at the time took part in launching the Cool LA initiative. Our initiative is designed to help Angelinos better manage the impacts of extreme heat caused by climate change, especially the older adults. Um, and then speeding along here, I'm sorry, let me go ahead and move over to the slide that I'm referring to. Um, especially older adults, income qualified families, and those living in underserved communities where hot weather has especially significant impact. Cool LA includes increased rebates ranging from $75 to $250 on various types of cooling units to help LEDWP customers overcome the health risk associated with um, extreme heat. Um, on your slides, um, I identified a couple of programs, the Cool LA Initiative, since it was launched, we had approximately 7,100 air conditioning rebates since the launch of the program in September of 2022. This includes portable cooling, um, wall and window AC units. Um, the Comprehensive Affordable Multifamily Retrofits Program, along with the Home Energy Improvement Program, um, was able to, well, first, the first one, camera, 9,477 units um, are in the pipeline, that's dwellings. Um, these are multifamily residential dwellings. And there is approximately 19,000 installations for this uh, weatherization program that we do for HYPE to um, make sure that the home is um, sealed correctly. And then for our consumer rebate program, we have participation of 599 HVAC units, either central or split. And then we also offer heat pumps, uh, central heat pumps, and we have participation of 78 um, since July of 2020. Now the latter being, um, these latter programs has a more expensive unit, so that's why we don't have as much participation. But the Cool LA initiative has actually increased the participation and it's meant for um, the income qualified customers. And, um, some of these are offerings our customers to our current participants in one of the following, which is on the left-hand side, Easy Save, Senior Citizen Disability Lifeline, Physician Certified Allowance Discount, and Life Support Equipment Discount. So we regularly execute campaigns at LADWP to improve awareness and participation because these customers actually get an additional incentive in purchasing these products. And in some cases, for these Cool LA Initiative rebates, we were able to, customers were able to uh, obtain a portable AC unit at zero cost to them. So we definitely um, see the importance of this and we're working with our um, partners to improve participation and awareness. I also added at the back of your packets in your um, uh, presentation more information on our programs, other programs that we have, and especially links and how to, uh, for our customers to participate in them. Um, 
So if you have any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, my name is Armin Sayan, um, and I'm uh, assistant manager to the Efficiency Solutions Engineering team in support of the uh, customer incentive programs. Um, I'd like to walk through some of the analysis we made and some of the assumptions we made uh, in response to this council motion. Um, so primarily, we looked at the definition of cooling apparatus as air conditioning for the sake of looking at uh, particularly air conditioning devices. Now, we purposefully selected the least cost and least intrusive types of air conditioning that would provide cooling access. So we primarily looked at uh, standard portable AC units as well as window and wall AC units uh, for, for this particular analysis. I have some statistics about uh, what we estimated for total of rental units as well as income qualified versus um, non, uh, market rate. Um, there's a bit of a discrepancy in some of these figures provided just because of the sources of information we pulled this from. Um, and and this will be more useful for estimating the, the budget implications that we would have for the uh, incentive programs themselves. Um, another particular uh, assumption made was that LADWP incentives would be uh, the same as what we have in the Cool LA campaign, which would be about $225 uh, per unit as well as uh, $75 per unit for uh, income qualified and non-income qualified um, participants. On the next slide, we have the grid impact. And on the top right chart, you'll see the annual uh, grid impacts throughout the whole year and we have a substantial amount of cooling throughout the year in, in, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, the, and as you zoom in to the peak day, which happens to be the hottest day of the year, uh, what we could see here is that we could expect to see um, for the least efficient product uh, of, of the ones that we chose, the, the standard portable unit, uh, we could expect to see about 190 megawatts of uh, peak load increase uh, due to these uh, units coming out into the grid. Um, and so that's for the total of 191,000 rental units um, effectively. Now as we apply a more efficient product, uh, which would be the higher efficiency window, window wall units, uh, we could expect to decrease that uh, peak impact by about 60 megawatts. So effectively ending up with 130 megawatts. And to give you a sense of scale, uh, compared to our uh, record back in 2017, uh, the record peak, this is roughly in the range of 3 to 2% of, of, that, of that peak. 3 to 2? Right. So 3 to 2% of that peak that, that was uh, recorded back in 2017. That, that would be the equivalence of this uh, load impact that we're looking at. And this is for the, for the entire system, so for all of, all of the LADWP territory. Um, on the next slide here uh, are some of the customer cost impacts. So for the standard portable unit, um, the average annual cost to the customer would be about $300. And looking at the total life cycle uh, of about nine years for these types of products, you're looking at about uh, 2700 uh, overall cost. And for the window wall unit that's more uh, efficient, we're looking at about $30 difference uh, for the annual uh, as well as uh, $2,400 for the, for the whole life cycle. Now, uh, in terms of the utility cost impacts, this is effectively for what would be budgeted for uh, the incentive programs. Um, given some of the discrepancies we mentioned about income qualified versus non-income qualified, this is something we need to refine. We would look at a cost range of approximately 32 to $62 million uh, if we provided incentives at the rate of the Cool LA um, initiative. So this includes all the incentives and overhead costs, but this cost is not inclusive of potential upgrades required to the grid to accommodate for the load. Um, and this requires further study because there's a need to understand the concentration of where these units will be located and whether or not that overlaps with constrained areas that might get affected by this. So I'd be happy to uh, fill in any questions from the council committee. Thank you very much. Um, can you provide a little bit of information on the usage rates of the various assistance programs in place to assist customers? So what percentage of those who are eligible for these programs are actually enrolled 
and how can we boost enrollment? It's sort of an ad adjacent question. Um, I don't have the data, and you're referring to, just to make sure I understand the question, um, those who are income qualified eligible correct, and are actually not on these income qualified rates, is that yeah. correct? I don't have the information. Um, I know that the percentage is low and we're doing a lot of um, campaigns. I can get back to you on the percentages. Um, we even have grants um, that we work with the community-based organizations to try to help our customers um, you know, unroll online because some of them don't have ability to do that online. So we're working with them to allow them to get on these discounted rates so that they could start seeing those immediate impacts and also taking advantage of the rebate program. So I can get those numbers for you. That would be great. Thank you. And just two more questions. Um, does DWP have a position on ways that building envelope improvements could be implemented to address renters' extreme heat exposure? Um, is that something that you all are thinking about to help mitigate some of the yes. demand? Yes. So we do currently support uh, envelope measures in our efficiency programs. Uh, we have an uh, incentive for insulation. Uh, we, we have incentives for windows as well. Um, and, and so we are actually actively looking at additional measures to, to help support. And this is actually something we've queued up in the Cool LA campaign to look at additional measures. Too. What are some of the additional measures you're looking at? Um, so we have the uh, solar attic fan that just went through. Um, and, and this is actually something we haven't uh, incentivized previously, but we're recently going to start uh, incorporating that into the program. Um, we got about a dozen measures, um, and off the top of my head, we got um, the solar attic fan that I just mentioned, and, um, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Don't recall, but we could, That'd we be could great uh, to get that provide a list of that, yes. Okay. As a renter, one of the challenges I've found is that, you know, it's one thing to um, make those available to landlords, it's another thing for renters to feel empowered to go out and advocate for those to be implemented in their homes, so not sure how we fix that, but looking forward to working with you all on it. Um, last question. The county uh, wrote a report on a very similar motion passed in late 2022. Uh, has, has DWP coordinated at all with the county or other utilities or other jurisdictions that are also looking into or have already um, adopted residential cooling re requirements? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, we have some partnerships through um, an, a MOU, um, currently with the gas company, um, to do a larger reach for our um, programs. Um, and we do do individual partnerships with different universities, but not specifically with the county that I can think of at this time. Okay. I would something? say I would say we have had discussions with various folks in, within the industry and, and uh, different jurisdictions, but not necessarily a formalized partnership to um, um, cover this. Okay. this Perhaps it's what the county's doing may be um, informative. Colleagues, any questions? Council Member Blumenfield. Yes, um, probably predictably because I represent the hottest part of the city. Uh, we could be 30 degrees hotter than the west side at times. Have you done an, a regional analysis of this and, and looked at how this might work in, in some of the hotter areas and some of the more underserved? I mean, I think of, you know, Canoga Park, uh, super underserved and probably the hottest part of the city. Uh, so we do have analysis that have been broken down by what the California uh, building code has been uh, calling climate zones. So we do have it broken down by that, those areas. Um, and, and we could certainly provide information on that. Uh, this report didn't, it was all aggregated together, but we, we certainly do have that information. Um, are you specifically referring to impacts in that area in terms of comfort? Or, or well, I impacts and then also, I mean, if, if we're gonna roll something out um, <clears throat> how we might prioritize the areas that need it the most um, and need defined in this case by, by temperature. Um, and so one thing I do recall from, from the analysis work is that there, there is a, quite a bit of um, rentals without air conditioning within, within the valley, which was astonishing to me, uh, given the temperatures. Um, and so we, yes, but we do have some figures for that. And in terms of the
the incentives, they're, they're one and the same, equitable across the board um, for, for all customers effectively. But uh, I think in terms of marketing, we could certainly um, target particular areas more than others. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I want, I yeah. mean, I know that that's, you want to be, you have to be equitable with all customers. And when we did the AC tune-up program, which I guess is now morphed into the LA Cool in some ways, uh, that was part of it. Every, we, we really marketed it in the West Valley, and I, we got more folks to, to take advantage of it. But I don't know that there's a legal prohibition about, as long as you're not singling out an area arbitrarily, but if you were, were to say that areas where the, the average temperature is over 100 degrees in, a certain, you know, in this time frame would have a priority. So you're not, you're not singling out saying, you know, Venice versus Canoga Park, but you're saying this incentive is based on the heat index in, in your area. Is that, could that not be done? So um, one thing I can mention, uh, the basis for the incentives that we build out, um, what we try to do is quantify all the benefit streams and we would leverage that towards the incentives. Um, so depending on the effects and how much avoidable cost there is from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, uh, we would apply that towards the incentives. Uh, we could certainly look into that from a more granular standpoint of uh, certain areas. And we have had other offerings to that nature where um, if, if it belongs in a particular area and has a larger impact that has that benefit, it would receive a higher incentive. So we could certainly look into that. Right. And if I can add, um, I would certainly welcome the partnership in being able to market these programs to our customers. So with the different council districts, it would be great, you know, once we have um, a, a more specific plan, um, then we can definitely do that and, and be able to reach a lot of our customers, not just through our community-based organizations, but I know that a lot of them work with all of you and that you can bring that audience and we can definitely um, market those programs. One thing I'll mention about having some more of this granularity is that it does uh, apply a bit of a burden on the application process since we will need to collect more information and ask for, of that of the applicant. So it does add some complication to that and additional overhead to, to administer. It, it could, or, or you, I mean, you can just uh, overlay the heat index with the address and, you know, you could automatically spit that out in terms of, you could, you could do that priority wise you know, right now I could go online and see the average temperature at, at any given location. Um, so that's, that's one way. And right now, um, our new, we're mostly focused on retrofits. Are, are new buildings required to have AC? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. I don't think it's a code requirement. I believe heating is a, is a code requirement, um, but not necessarily cool. I, if I understood correctly, I think that was one of the considerations that, um, was being made uh, with LEDBS, um, but not necessarily executed just yet. Got it. Okay, because that's an obvious first step to... Uh, I, I would say it's a common practice to provide cooling for new construction in general at this point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have one quick question. Um, I'm sure your analysis includes the, our public housing units. In CD15, we've got about 5,000 uh, public housing units, mo the bulk of it in the north part of the district, and the bulk of that without any air. Uh, we, would be, we would be including public housing Hackley units in this analysis, correct? Um, I, I believe so, because we're talking about residential customers. So uh, I just want to make sure there's no gap in the analysis that because it's a publicly owned by a separate, set, technically a separate entity that we're not, you know, overlooking HACLA and overlooking the developments if, in if a very was, hot spot of the city, Watts, in a very, you know, without a, can, without a, a, a green canopy and with old infrastructure. So just, I'm just asking, make sure we're including Watts. So I would say this, this analysis was at a high level, okay? So if we are missing a gap there, it's relatively small to the order of magnitude for this. But in terms of providing incentives and, and having those offerings available, certainly is inclusive. Right, thank you. And not specifically related to this uh, council motion, but, um, and we can talk offline if you'd like, but we are working with HACLA and also other members of the mayor's office in doing something specific for that um, customer segment group. 
I don't see any more questions. Uh, so colleagues, if you concur, I'm going to recommend that we ask that the council file be joined with council file number 23-0453 and that we give instruction to CAO and LAHD to respond more expansively and include consideration of building efficiency programs and heat pumps in their responses. Uh, I'd like for the item to come back to this committee when the CAO and LAHD reports are available. Did you want to add CMO? Yes, and could we also add uh, our Climate Emergency uh, Mobilization Office as well to just the analysis and the report back? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, let's have the committee vote, please. Council Member Yaroslavsky? Yes. Council Member McOsker? Yes. Council Member Rahman? Yes. Council Member Blumenfield? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Four eyes and items approved as amended. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to turn now to item six, if we can take that one out of order uh, and have Mr. Hale join us. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Sutton Wills, would you please read the item? Item number six is a LA Department of Water and Power report relative to the incentives for building electrification and clean energy. Thank you. Uh, so no need for a presentation on this item, but I did have a, f a couple of questions. Um, a lot of the information in this report to me sounds like it actually belongs in the report back on our, our previous item. Um, I'd like to have seen greater connectivity between DWP's response on building electrification and indoor cooling. Um, I also think that DWP uh, undersold the efforts underway uh, to electrify buildings and, and was a little disappointed in the lack of detail in the report. But Anyway, turning to the, the section uh, on bill repayment, um, so why did DWP decide to retire the program as opposed to just hiring a third party? Uh, good, afternoon, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Matt Hale, the Director of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs for the Department. Um, and uh, the answer to that question is that the demand for that program dropped off. Um, so it was active between 2001 and 2019. In the last decade before it was discontinued, there was only one applicant, uh, and that applicant decided not to move forward with our financing because uh, every individual application under the ad code has to go before the board for approval. So it was taking between two and six months for them to get financing. Um, so ultimately, uh, it was the decision of management and the board uh, at the time to just discontinue the program, uh, wrap up the remaining loans that were uh, in place as of 2018. Um, and the private sector, I think, uh, financing was, was much more readily available for the kinds of upgrades that were, uh, that customers were interested in pursuing. So you think it's not needed given alternatives? Uh, I think uh, if we were to collectively work on identifying any gaps in financing for certain customer classes that can't pursue private financing for whatever reason, um, it might be worth exploring again. But um, if it's to be done through a third party administrator, we're gonna to have to ramp up some staff and uh, do an RFP and identify the right partner to, to do that work. Um, and if we were to pursue a change to the charter or the ad code to enable the department to um, offer those loans in a more expedited way, we'd have to do that I think thoughtfully and just make sure that we have the right safeguards in place for, um, for that program administration. Do you think the lack of interest in the program or uptake is, is reflective of just people didn't know about it or it was hard to access or is it is it something else? Is it that there's this alternative that's more desirable, or is it a combination of things? Um, there's a report that was concluded in, in 2018 that was kind of an after action, what, what to do next kind of uh, analysis, and, and it just seemed like there was not the same level of interest in the, the market with uh, private sector alternatives and private sector financing available. Um, but, um, it, you know, it, again, I think it, it was looking back instead of looking forward. So um, I think if we were to go out and survey what the need is, we might come up with a different answer now. Uh, but again, that, that I think that requires a little bit of dialogue with, uh, with your, your committee and, and leadership in the board. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just a quick question. Sure. Just, just follow up. How much of that? was the, uh, related to the interest rates. When, when this was going on, the interest rates were, were practically nothing, and now they've gone way up. What, what were the interest rates being charged in this program? Uh, according to the report, there wasn't any kind of outline of what it was, and it, I think it fluctuated with market conditions, but they were favorable is what, what they concluded. So it was very comparable with what you would get, you know, for, um, for private sector financing 
when it was two, three percent interest rates. Right. I, I would imagine if we still had two, three percent interest rates now, and the market now is, you know, seven, eight percent, probably for something like this. And, and that might actually be one of the considerations in reviving a program like this is to fill a gap that you know folks are having trouble getting their project financed with the current interest rates. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, seeing no further questions, we're going to note and file this report. Mr. Cle Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly, Madam Chair. Council Member Yaroslavsky? Yes. Council Member McOsker? Yes. Council Member Rahman? Yes. Council Member Blumenfield? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Four ayes and the item is noted and filed. Thank you very much. Uh, moving to item five, uh, Mr. Sutton Wills, would you please read the item? Item number five is a Los Angeles Department of Water and Power report relative to the bi-weekly update on why competitive, competitive proposals or bidding were not reasonably practical. Thank you very much for this item. We have um, from DWP staff, Milad Tagavi and Jaime Valenzuela. Welcome. Uh, if you could very briefly, uh, like in two minutes or less, uh, give us some key updates, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Milad Tegyabi. I'm the Director of Water Operations Division. I oversee the department's water operation activities within the CW centers as well as in Eastern Sierra. Here with me is Mr. Jaime Venezuela, Manager of Owens Lake Capital Development and Implementation. Uh, we're very pleased and we'd like to thank the, the committee, the council, and the mayor for their support during this difficult process. We are getting to the end uh, of the need for the declaration. Uh, hopefully within the next six to eight weeks, we will be able to make that call. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the impact of uh, Tropical Storm Hillary, and if there's any change needed to address uh, the impact as a result of that. In terms of uh, one of the things that I want to kind of uh, highlight as, uh, and thank the committee and the council and the mayor for their for the support, is the, the key element of the department's ability to effectively manage the runoff and minimize the damage to the city's aqueduct system has been through the use of contracts. Although under the declaration of the local emergency, competitive bidding was temporarily suspended, the department has used existing contracts which were competitively bidded to provide materials and equipment rentals as well as science and technology services during this uh, effort. The department also obtained three bids uh, for, from construction companies with extensive experience working in the area, meaning Inyo County, as well as ability and resources to mobilize quickly for the needed construction services. Uh, then based on those bids, the department negotiated with the lowest bidder and ultimately awarded a contract to the current contractor that we're using, which is Sally Miller, Sally Miller construction company. Uh, in terms of um, uh, if the board is interested, is we just submitted, our committee, I'm sorry, is, is interested, we just submitted our latest report, bi-weekly report, but I could go over any component of that. In particular, uh, just to kind of uh, uh, to talk about the, the amount of funds that have been used for this project. Uh, we have basically used uh, construction services, rock for material, rental and also science and technology contracts for the engineering component of it. Uh, the amount that has been awarded uh, to date, or at, at least as of August 9th, uh, is about $52.5 million. However, only $26.8 million has been invoiced to date. So the work has been completed. We are in the process of, of course, getting that information from the contractors and uh, uh, reimbursing them for that work. We hope to be able to finish the work related to the, uh, the storm events by the next six weeks and hopefully two more weeks to finish the administration part of it and come to you and thank you for your support and basically uh, uh, request that the declaration to be uh, ended. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you and your team um, for resolving these repairs so quickly. Uh, colleagues, anything else you'd like to add? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, seeing no more discussion, we're going to vote to note and file this item. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Yaroslavsky? Yes. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Rahman? Yes. 
Council Member Bloomfield. Bloomfield, aye. Council Member Hernandez. And four ayes and the items noted in the file. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone. That concludes our agenda. Have a great weekend.